Well, speaking of the Pray Vote Stand Summit, my next guest is among those who will be there, and you'll be hearing from him. And today, he is out with a new book, his 60th book. I've almost read 60 books. He's written them. And this is one that every parent, grandparent, pastor, teacher, church leader should read. Why? Because we are living in a turbulent time, and children in the family unit are more vulnerable than ever before. And we talk about wanting to impact the culture. Well, your greatest ability to impact the world is right under your own roof. It's called your children. Here to unpack this and more is George Barna, Director of Research at Arizona Christian University's Cultural Research Center and Senior Fellow here at the Family Research Council Center for Biblical Worldview, and the author of the new book, Raising Spiritual Champions, Discipling America's Children. Dr. Barna, thanks so much for joining me today. Good to be with you, Tony. Thanks for having me. And congratulations on your new book. I see it's already trending on uh, Amazon as uh, top of the list there. You know, miracles still happen. What can I say? So let's just talk about this is something you, you are passionate about, and it is really a culmination of years of work. This is not just an ordinary book. It's really a guide for parents and grandparents that is Bible-based and research-supported. Uh, Let's start with, can you, can you share what went into this and why you are so focused on this topic? Yeah, there, there's a lot behind that, Tony, as you know. Part of it is we, we did seven new research projects to build into this book so that it wasn't just my opinion. It was really a, a deeper, more sophisticated look at what's going on in American culture today. And the reason why it's so important that we talk about children is because as you and I and many others try to figure out how do we bring America back to God? How do we restore this nation to its biblical spiritual roots? How do we make America great again? It really comes back to the issue of worldview. Why? Because worldview is the basis of every decision that every person makes. What does that have to do with children? Our worldview develops by the age of 13, starts at about 15 to 18 months of age. As you and I have talked about on this show before, by the age of 13, it's pretty well fully formed for the rest of a person's life. For most people, unless there's a major crisis and the Holy Spirit really intervenes and changes their life trajectory, you're going to stick with that worldview that you had at the age of 13. So for parents and grandparents and pastors and teachers and all of us who can have influence on the lives of children, it's critically important that we be thinking about what can we do to set them up into a lifelong love relationship with God, understanding that they were made by him to know him and love him and serve him with all their heart, mind, strength, and soul. And if we can do that, we can see the whole country turn around. All these social and political problems that we talk about will fade away because people will make different decisions than they're making today. In America today, people don't have a biblical worldview. Why? Because when they were children, their parents, their grandparents, their teachers, their pastors didn't care about them and the kingdom of God enough to make sure that we were investing in them while they were young so that when they grew up, we they wouldn't depart from God's ways. So, so really, in many ways, your research shows that we're kind of overstepping the most important aspect in terms of turning our culture back to God. We, we, we've kind of, we've, we're kind of missing it. What, what does your research insight show us? You go through in the book, how is it that we are taking the wrong approaches? What are we doing? Well, there are a number of things. There's no single thing, but it all starts out with the fact that Americans have become so narcissistic. We think everything is about us. And so, yeah, we want our children to have a good life. Yeah, we love our children. We want them to be happy, want them to have a fun childhood. But therein lies the problem. The uh, goals that we've established for our children are few and far between. And when we look at the ones that have been established, it has to do with making sure that our reputation remains intact as parents, as adults, uh, trying to do what we can to ensure that our children 
like us, that they appreciate us, that they're having a fun life, as opposed to sitting back and trying to figure out, but wait a minute, why did the God who created us put us here on this earth? It wasn't just to have fun and have a good time. And so we've got a, a misunderstanding from the very start. We looked at what are the things that parents are most committed to seeing happen in their children's lives. And they were things related to their child's health, their academic achievement, their emotional stability, their sense of security, their breadth of experiences. These were the kinds of things that surpassed everything else. When we looked at how many of the parents say that one of their top priorities in raising their children has to be what they do with the spiritual development of their children. And that's a broader term, not necessarily encompassing worldview development, but just taking a look at their spiritual development. Only one out of three parents said that was even a priority. And then as you dug deeper into what is the nature of that spiritual priority, you found that very, very few parents were even thinking about worldview, its impact on life, what they could do to facilitate it in their child's life. And that's why we're in the situation we're in. I mean, George, when you describe the priorities of parents, it, it really kind of sounds like, to me, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, where Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these other things will be added unto you. It's like we're focusing on these things that actually we get if we seek that which is above all things, and that is that relationship with God. You don't have to worry about your kids, whether or not they like you or not. You know, our, our goal should be for have them to have them respect us because we're consistent in our parenting and we're parenting according to a standard. Uh, let, let me let me go into this. Your your research identifies four key strategies that parents can use to successfully disciple their children, and and the heartbeat for this process is the seven cornerstones of a biblical worldview. Uh, before we get into each of those cornerstones, can you can you tell us how they were identified? Yeah, it's interesting. We, we've been doing a lot of research at the Cultural Research Center in Arizona Christian University related to worldview in America. And as I tend to do late at night, I'll sit here playing with data. And I was trying to figure out the answer to a critical question, which is, you know, where where would we start? if we really wanted to be effective at helping somebody develop a biblical worldview. And as I was toying with the information, the, the statistics came back and showed me, you know what, there's one combination of beliefs that if you really own all seven of these beliefs, the chances are very high. You've got an 83% probability of developing a full biblical worldview if you start out by embracing these seven cornerstones. On the other hand, if you don't embrace all seven of them, you've got only a 2% probability of developing a biblical worldview. And it was one of those moments, you know, where you fall on your knees and say, thank you, Lord, for months and months, really years, I've been looking for something that would point us in the direction of where do we start? And that's what I believe these seven cornerstones represent, is a terrific starting place for building a solid foundation for your children. And, and frankly, when I looked at the seven cornerstones, I, I laughed because I thought, oh my gosh, nobody's going to take me seriously when I put this out there because these are so simple. It, it's like Sunday School 101. But then what that reminded me is, number one, most people don't go to Sunday School anymore. Number two, those who do don't learn these seven cornerstones in Sunday school very often. And number three, this shows us how far we've gotten from the basics of the Christian faith, where we're more concerned about our emotions than we are about God's truths and a mm -hmm. lifestyle that represents him well in the culture. So I think the seven cornerstones represent that great starting place that almost anybody can wrap their mind and their heart and their soul in their arms around and say, you know what, this is something I can share with my kids or my grandkids, my students, the individuals that I coach on a ball team. These are the kinds of things that I can bring into conversation with them at any time. All right, George, we have a little less than seven minutes to go. So let's talk about these seven cornerstones. 
What's the first one? Well, the first one is simply that you not only believe that God exists, but that you embrace some of the attributes of who that God is, that he knows everything, that he has all power, he can do all things. He created everything, and therefore he is responsible for the direction of everything. Uh, you know, he loves the things that he created, especially us. He cares about us. And, you know, so it, understanding the very nature of God is the starting point of that. If you don't believe in God, of course, you're not going to develop a biblical worldview because it all comes from him and it's all based on his character and his nature. And number two, the cornerstone focuses on one's view of the human condition. Explain that. Yeah, I mean, this really has to do with recognizing that when we're born, we're born as sinners. We're born into sin. That's our nature. It's our inclination. And so that has dramatic consequences for the rest of our life. We can't just say, yeah, I'm a sinner, so what? That's going to impact who we are, how we live what we wind up doing in life, the choices we make. So recognizing ourselves as sinners is a big step toward moving forward into a better life. So how do most people describe their view of the human condition? Uh, they would say, not only are we not sinners, they're not concerned about sin. Most people think they're going to go to heaven after they die. Uh, sin is not something that's on their radar. Most people describe themselves as good people, and that's what they actually equate to being Christian, is being a good person based on my own best efforts, my own good thoughts about myself, and that's as far as they take it. That might, that, that might be one of the reasons we don't hear much about sin anymore. Uh, the, the third cornerstone, we're going to run out of time here, the third cor cornerstone really segues from the previous, and that is it focuses on salvation. Yeah, I mean, it's the antidote to, to step number two. If you recognize that you're a sinner and that it has dramatic consequences, what do you do about it? Well, Jesus is really the only antidote to your sin uh, disease. And so we have to confess our sins, acknowledge that we're sinners, uh, desire deeply in our hearts to repent, to turn our lives around. But we can only do that through the power and the direction of Christ, who's going to live within us and show us that better way forward. And the cornerstone in the middle is the, the Bible, and I, I talk a lot about that on this program. You can't have a biblical worldview without the Bible. Let's, let's move to, we've really just got a couple minutes left, let's move to the, the fifth one, and it, it focuses on absolute moral truth. That's a big challenge today. It is. Most Americans don't believe there is such a thing as absolute moral truth or that there can be such a thing as absolute moral truth, and yet that's precisely why God gave us the Bible was to know what truth is, regardless of our feelings, regardless of our circumstances. And so recognizing that it's the Bible that points us in that right direction, that it is absolute moral truth, and it helps us to understand how to live a better life, that's, that's absolutely critical. And the sixth one focuses on the big question, the purpose of human life. Yeah, why are you here? Kids, you know, as young as one and two and three years old, we found, are starting to wrestle with that question. The answer is a lot simpler than we make it out to be. We're here to know, love, and serve God with all our heart, mind, strength, and soul. He made us for his purposes. And so if we can get over our own arrogance and recognize that and live accordingly, it makes life a whole lot simpler. All right, George, the uh, the seventh one, they're going to have to wait on this to either to buy the book. Where can they get a copy of the book? Amazon.com. It's available starting today in both vig uh, digital and paperback versions. Or you can come to the Prevote Stand Summit where George will be speaking on this topic, I'm sure. But we're out of time or I would give you the seventh cornerstone. George, always great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Tony.